Come on down, guys, and listen to us chat. We love chatting, you know. You just listen to us. We're so funny. We're so interesting and entertaining. You love it. Married, not dead. What happened yesterday is something that we have to talk about. We have to spend a little time on it because yesterday, and I don't know if the three you saw it, there was a big, big victory for social media warriors. And unfortunately, a big loss for society. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Are you talking about the University of Tennessee? I am. And we have spent some time on this podcast having conversations around the dangers of social media running amok and actually being powerful enough to ruin people's careers, whether it be we talk about sexual harassment allegations or rape allegations. We've seen um, social media clap back on Bill Maher. And we talked about that when he said the N word. And like I said before, a lot of this stuff is justified in terms of did the person actually do something, but it's, it's in questionable justification whether or not the punishment fits the crime. And what we saw yesterday might be the new norm. And so it's important to bookmark it in our mind and say, whoa, let's take a step back and assess what this new world looks like that we're all in and that we're bringing our children into. Uh, so, so that everybody's on the same page, Tennessee was about to announce the hiring of Greg Schiano as their head coach. He was a former defensive coordinator for Ohio State. But before that, uh, or two stops before that, three stops even, he worked at Penn State as an assistant coach during the Sandusky child molestation trials. And, And do you guys, you guys remember that? Yep. Of course. Yeah. So there was uh, an offhand comment, hearsay is what the court called it, where one coach that had knowledge of Sandusky's uh, molestations said that another coach had told him that Greg Schiano had witnessed Sandusky doing something with a boy. And this made it to court. And hundreds of documents were filed through. People went to jail over it. Shiano wasn't one of them. And it was found that that never happened. And he had moved on. He's coached the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's coached Rutgers. It was was proved that it it, it couldn't be. Couldn't be proven. Couldn't be proven. It's unsubstantiated. Uh, The coach that the coach that had supposedly told the other coach said it never happened either. So that's really important as well. It'd be like if I said that Jason came to me and told me that Nick saw something. And then Jason says, no, I never went to Chris and told him that Nick saw something. Does that make sense now? A little bit clear. Right, right, right. So once Tennessee found out that Greg Shano was going to be the coach, which is the coach they don't want, the fans don't want, they used his past as a way to ensure that the hiring didn't happen or to protest the hiring, which is fine. And that happens all the time. Fans, football fans, especially are a bit nutty. They're truly fanatics. And You're talking about UT, right? Yeah. University that's of Tennessee. A, that, yeah. That's a, that's a chart topper there on fanatical. So why didn't they want them? They want a big name. They, they, they wanted 
a bigger coach name. They wanted, we've had some um, dud coaches here in Tennessee uh, over the last years. And Tennessee used to be a top flight program, won a national championship in 1998. And I think that there are some fans that are still living off the fumes of that glory. And, but, but the team hasn't been good in a decade. Hasn't been, let's say a top 25 team in a decade. Okay. So they didn't want them. And so they use this. Now, like I said, fans always protest. But here's what was different. Politicians got on Twitter to rail against this hiring without knowing any of the facts. No facts. The fans did the same thing. And the athletic director at this university withdrew his offer to Greg Schiano. So he lost a job. He had left Ohio State to take this job. He lost the job after being given uh, an opportunity to have the job. And he also has had his reputation marred. So now, anytime he gets a job or anywhere time someone Googles him, it will be now coupled with child molestation. Well, mm. let, let's back this up, okay? Because a couple, I think we've said a couple of things that I don't necessarily believe are true. Number one, the, the fact that you say that UT hasn't, so number one, not a UT fan, okay? Not really a big college football fan in general. Mm-hmm. Disclaimer. Uh, more of a disclaimer. I'm more of a pro. I don't want to seem like I'm, you know, pro UT and I'm just, you know, I'm like the fanboy here. But UT uh, finished last year ranked 22nd. So to say they're not a top 25 team in years is, is not true. They went nine and four the last two seasons, 2016, 2015. This year, not so good. But they were a top 25 team the last two years mm. prior to this one. Okay. They slid um, in. Was it, is that the AP poll, coaches poll? AP um, poll, coaches poll. They were Coaches poll, they were 23rd in 2015, and they were 22nd in the AP. In 2016, they were 24th and 22nd. Gotcha. So, so they're, and, hovering, and, in and the, they're pretty, hovering in that area. Yeah. Fair, they're hovering in that enough. area. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I mean, so they're not. And, and I do believe, was it, um, was it right before they, they fired uh, Phil Fulmer, which was less than 10 years ago, I believe. And, and they actually were playing for, in the SEC championship game. Um, so, I mean, they, you know, they've, they've, they're not as far gone as, as you want to say, but they're nowhere near they, where they were before. And you're right to say that the fan base is, is a little bit uh, have uh, well, they, heightened expectations. Well, Brian, they didn't win a game in the SEC this year. So I think they are as far away as they've ever been now. Now, if you're talking about historically over the last 10 years. Well, no, you mean, but you're you talking about the last about 10 years, right. they haven't been uh, any relevant. And that, they're not, we're not saying they're Vanderbilt. That's what you no, said. No, but they've been beaten by Vanderbilt this isn't Kentucky many times in the about. last 10 years, right? Like, I think, I think Vanderbilt had never beaten them up into the last 10 years, actually. Right. Until the Jay I, I Cutler actually, era. Okay. Uh, Is that right? We can go against the Maddox. I'm just saying that, yeah, I think you're reporting yeah. that they're they're less than what they truly are. Well, so let, the me, job let, me, actually, let, me, let me clarify it, because this is an important point. If it weren't, I wouldn't clarify what I was saying. Okay, you got so, a lot of angry people listening, right? And I am a UT fan, so I'll, I'll put that out there. But here's the deal. UT thinks it's Alabama. That's a little bit more clear. They're not as relevant as Alabama. They have not been as relevant as Alabama. They are not as relevant as Georgia. They have not been as relevant as Georgia. They are not as relevant as USC. They are not as relevant as Ohio State. And they have not been in the last 10 years. So that's I would agree clear. with I would agree with all that's, that. That's that's what and I mean. Yes, that's correct. And so so from the and and I feel like uh I, you know, I feel like you've given kind of the national view uh, of kind of what you've given the, the national view of of the outsiders looking in on someone that doesn't follow the UT fan base fan base in in school from a daily and lives in it. And having, you know, I talk to my brother every day and he is someone that does. He is a and fan. So I feel like, yeah, he is a Uber fan. He's been my whole life. And in some part, I am, I do somewhat pull for them. I actually just like watching just SEC football. I think mm-hmm. it's fun. Best but, football, um, yeah. Yeah. So what I'll, what I'll say is, um, you know, UT just earlier, was it earlier this year or was it the end of last year? Paid out like two, two million plus uh, in settlements for a Title IX about uh, women being uh, being uh, uh, like, what was it? Uh, something like 
uh, physical and sexual assault, I believe, Mm -hmm. for student athletes, by student athletes. We're talking about that was a year ago. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to go out after you've had the most, um, you have a coach current or that you just got rid of in Butch Jones and Butch Jones was a, um, he was, uh, alienating the fan base. He was alienating f- former players. He was, uh, aggressive to the media. He was, um, he was, um, standoffish actually, you know, stories are coming out now about how, you know, he bullied some players, yeah. Um, we had last year, we had that star, the running back that was actually going to uh, set the all time record at UT for running. He transferred. Mm-hmm. OK, we're talking about like the, the, the program has started deteriorating from last year and it all all signs point to a bully, aggressive head coach. Now let's look at Greg Schiano. Greg Schiano, if you look at his tenure at Tampa Bay. Uh, he was seen as an aggressive uh, uh, a coach at Rutgers. There are stories of him pushing uh, or putting scouts, pro scouts, um, and, and having them only be in a small section, almost like keeping them over to the side, not really, you know, not really being, you know, there's there is countless reports after reports that say of how he has mistreated uh, staff. Very much similar. What we're talking about here is UT was about to hire Butch Jones on steroids. Mm. Okay. The fan base did not want that. Number one. No, they didn't. Uh, No. Uh, Number two, you're talking about last year, you just paid out $2.3 million um, in in settlements to to women. And now you're talking about getting a coach that, number one, is uh, the same coach you have on steroids. Okay. And two is a whiff of the worst scandal to ever hit college football. The worst. Okay. Well, maybe any professional sport. Any, or, any or, professional I mean, sport. College or, or pro. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's the worst. It's the worst. And and and, and that's okay. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I'm trying to think of the word um, it, that you use when you go into a room and you talk to a lawyer and they ask you some questions before you go into actual trial. Uh, and they're documented and they're, and what am I trying to say? What is that called? Um, you, uh, Nick's got the jury duty history here. <laughs> you know, it's when you, you, you go and you talk to like two different, they, uh, and they ask you questions. Cross examining. I don't know. It's that's a, what it's happens a during the case. Yeah, but it's a technical term, but like that, the, the thing that we're saying is hearsay actually, I believe happened in one of those. So it was it was documented and later, he, you know, it, but it was done during a civil case and not the um, not the main criminal case. So there is some smoke there. So why the fuck would you bring somebody into your program that even smells like that, that has the same qualities of, of this? The problem is the fan base didn't want him. And, you know, there are, there are members out there that know how to stir it up like Clay Travis, right? Mm-hmm. And Clay Travis started up and he got it going. But, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, not Jimmy, Jimmy Sexton is the, uh, is the agent. And I believe that he is uh, really kind of driving this national media uh, perspective of you look at UT, look at these hillbillies because he was, you know, he's got a little bit of egg on his face because he was the one that is the agent of uh, Greg Schiano. So uh, there's, it was there's the, a lot it was of the angles top, to play here. It was the top story on Twitter. So that's how I found it out. So this became the top oh, national Dan, story it was on yesterday. Dan Patrick, it's on everything. So, so I saw it yesterday on Twitter as the top training story, not the top training sports story, just the top training story, period. And I read all the comments. And that's where I started to get a little bit incensed. I started reading all the comments and I was like, dude, these are Tennesseans that have lost their mind. And I read the political statements, the the people who are in office there who don't know anything about (laughs) this person. And so I agree with you. The issue is that Greg Schiano is a bad hire, not the right guy for a team that thinks they deserve a Nick Saban. They think they deserve an Urban Meyer, who, by the way, is an aggressive coach and shuts the media out and, and does different things. So these guys are are winning, is my point. Graciano 
took a Rutgers team that hadn't won in a really long time and made them winners. And, and I know that we excuse a lot for winning, uh, but I still think he wasn't a good hire for Tennessee. The point, the problem is, and how it relates back to what we've been talking about over the last four weeks is social media did this. This wasn't uh, necessarily kids with sticks and signs. That happened after the social media happened instead of the other way around. It didn't go protest and then it hit social media. Oh, the kids are protesting on the, on the campus. It went social media and then the kids came out. That's the terrifying part. And no matter how good or bad of a coach you think Shiano is for this team, the guy deserves. Here's here's the funny thing. Tennessee paid out two point three million, like you said, last year. They're going to end up paying a libel lawsuit again to Greg Shiano. So they're going to egg, 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 the, egg on their face and twice. They might. Yeah, they might owe him money because yeah. they signed a contract. Yep, they're like going to owe the, him uh, something. He's going to walk away <laughs> with a pretty penny in his hand because, I mean, not even the contract, but, yeah, him leaving his prior employment. And, you know, is there an opportunity for him to go back? You know, what are those options there? Yeah, he needs to he needs to walk away with something. Yeah, it, that's the point. The point is the foolishness of the leadership at Tennessee. One, to think that, you know, to, to make – this decision and and not even know that the fan base wouldn't react well to it. But then secondly, to have the cowardice to let social media, social justice warriors and bullies back you down as a university so, and tell you how to run your business. So, um, yeah, but I, I, I so I, somewhat I agree with that. But at the same time, you know, um, this isn't Vol's Twitter. You know what I mean? This isn't like this is this is more than that. This is people that uh, never speak about things like this. And because of the because uh, of the Sandusky uh, angle have come out, my wife knew about it. Right. My That's wife the dirty part it, of it. hasn't watched a. F- my wife knew about it and, and, and told me like I, last night on the couch. It's funny because I was like, hey, have you heard about this? She's like, oh, let me tell you. And she told me the entire story. Right. That's the fucked up part about it. That's what I'm trying to say. It's 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 terrible because instead of just saying, hey, this is a bad coach. We protest this higher. We don't want this coach. He's aggressive with past players. That's who Butch Jones was. We don't want another Butch Jones on steroids. Instead, the social justice warriors pulled this child molestation past that he's been exonerated of in court. He's been hired by ESPN, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Ohio State. He's been vetted by all of them. They use that to put pressure on the AD who then backed down. And so how else can social media affect you, me, Nick, Jason in our real lives? What, you know, what is our recourse in this yeah, world? It, and that's the. And it was funny you mentioned that. I was actually thinking about a totally different uh, situation that happened recently. But it's not just social media, right? It's basically, uh, it's just information. That's what it comes down to. So social media is just a mechanism through which people get and share information. Uh, just like, you know, news, you know, that people are watching. The whole fake news thing has been going on for a, a while now. And it's that type of thing. It's like, what can the manipulation of information in this information age do to people like that, people like us? I mean, I think it's legit. You know, this isn't, it, it's, the more we get, um, I guess, inundated by it and indoctrinated by it, the more time we spend on these different outlets as opposed to actually reading, you know, from legitimate sources. Yeah, it's just going to get worse. You know, one of the things, what did I say? One of the things that I'm not thankful for at Thanksgiving was having to raise children in a social media environment. Mm-hmm. It's tough, man, because you don't know what you're, you don't know if what you're reading is true. Uh, and you also know that people will run with false information as if it were true. Right. So they can get in their one liner so they can, so they can have their funny troll moment. Yeah, dude. I mean, I got, let me give you this one right now. Cause we, we exhausted uh, this discussion about Tennessee, but it rolls into this one, which is, uh, let's see a woman who falsely came, claimed uh, to the Washington post that Roy Moore, the Republican U S Senate candidate in Alabama 
impregnated her as a teenager, appears to work with an organization that uses deceptive tactics to secretly record conversations in an effort to embarrass its targets. Yeah, I read about this. It's unbelievable. It's believable, but it's so sinister. Yeah, man, this the organization sets up undercover stings that involve using false cover stories and covert video recordings meant to expose what the group says is media bias. You know right. they're, they're <clears throat> lying to the media. They're telling them that we've got this, you know, if someone coming, this person did this to me. Right. And I'm going to give you this exclusive story and I want you to protect me and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to give you all this stuff. But the whole time I'm doing that, I'm asking you, so what do you think that'll do to him if if this comes out? What do you think that'll do to his career? What do you think this means for them? How, how do you feel about this situation? What do you think is going on? And they're trying to rope them in. And, I mean, this is, you know, like the, the Washington Post did not publish this story. You know, they were able to figure out that this was a sting operation. This was fake. Um, but man, they must have been on top of their game, right? To be able to do that, because you know the people on the other side, they're good at what they do. Yeah. And that's that's where it gets terrifying because the the line between reality and falsehoods, the line between us being protected as as just everyday citizens and being destroyed is how bad a journalist wants or needs a story to break with his or her name on it and how strong are they going to vet a source? Yeah. It comes back down to great, great journalistic integrity and, and you can't always count on it. We got lucky this time. Um, but I mean, I think you're seeing that, um, on the, uh, Going back to the to the Rutgers coach, uh, Greg Schiano, or the Tennessee thing. I mean, you're seeing that on both sides because, you know, at the same time, you're saying, you know, how much does someone need to see their name saying that news broke? Right. Well, that's what I was getting at about the national the national uh, version of this. The national story is that, you know, is it? Oh, look at these hick Tennessee fans that have driven their coach away, you know, Um well, just you know, just using just those... using the word "hick" though disqualifies them as a credible source to me. It's it's not a journalistic yeah, okay. word. But I mean, you know, and, and I've been sitting here doing a little digging because I, I at first I couldn't believe I um I I couldn't remember remember the word. But uh, so the, they, these were actually this was actually a uh, a question answer session with a lawyer and. The documents uh, were unsealed in Pennsylvania case involving Penn State Insurance Company. Uh, let's see. Basically, they asked they asked him if uh, Shiano knew anything, and this was a lawyer talking to to Mike McCreary, who's the guy that basically was he ultimately the whistleblower in this, right? The main, mm-hmm. yeah. And to quote him, um, um, did he give any details about what Coach Shiano had reported to him? Uh, McCreary, no. Only that he had, uh, I can't remember if it was one night or in the morning, but that Greg had come into his office white uh, and he had saw Jerry do something to a boy in a shower. So, I mean, like that, that right there is damaging. That was in a document that was testified. Um, and I don't right, know, man. Right. I, that's, that's what I we're think, talking about. I think about. that that's, there was enough. And, and that's so what they're saying that, has been dis- discredited as hearsay. That exact line. That was discredited as hear, hearsay. And it could be smoke, but it was discredited as hearsay. And he's been hired three other times, is, is my point. But I, but I think what I'm saying about it, and, and I'm majored in journalism, is that there comes times, and, and this has happened before, if you look at Philip Glass and uh, the, the cat from the New York Times, like where people make up stories because they need a career boost so badly, because they want to become the next Dan Rather or whatever. Right. And so we got lucky with the Washington Post vetting this source. Otherwise, Roy, there would be another story out um, about Roy Moore. And then this fake group would come back and say, oh, I lied to you. There's media bias. And we would be in this cycle, this cyclone of just hell where we wouldn't know what was real and what was false. 
Yeah, man. They even came out and said that uh, the Washington Post, they were doing some, you know, some other sneaky stuff. And they were saying the Washington Post was calling people in this woman's town and offering them money to give them other disparaging information about Roy Moore, which, of course, never happened. But yeah, yeah, it's terrible, man. But that's, you know, you've got two things at work, right? You have the manipulation of information and you have the mob mentality, Mm -hmm. Right. And I think social media, the short attention span, uh, maybe this idea that, you know, even like Facebook is the new news, you know, for a lot of people, you know, like you mentioned about Twitter. Right. How did you know about this? Well, top of the Twitter, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like that's where people are getting their stuff from. So, yeah, if there's a snowball effect with this, it seems like people are just getting on, you know, hey, this would be part of the snowball. Like, I don't need to read. I don't need to research. I need to figure this stuff out. No, I just just roll with it because if that many people are saying it, it must be true. Or if that news, you know, medium is saying it, it must be true. You know, it's just it's it is crazy and it's uh, it's scary because you never know which situation, you know, whether it's going to be you, you get impacted by something like that, like that whole allegation thing. Mm-hmm. Like it's not you don't have to be proven guilty of anything. Not you today. Just, no, they just have to allege it and forget about it. You can forget about your legacy, forget about your career in some cases. You know, it can be done. So your, it's just, best, yeah, def- it's, your best defense is the news cycle because it happens so fast. People forget who you are in the short term or maybe in the long term or both because the next juicy story comes out. Um, maybe that's, I don't know, or stay in the house, which maybe that might be the ultimate <laughs> goal is to get everybody to stay in the house and not be connected and united in fighting for just causes. Yeah, uh, but that news cycle is not going to get Shiana's job back. No, it, it, it won't. But, it, you know, it ought to like in a just world, it ought to. But if I were Shiano, I, there's no way in hell I'd want to go to Tennessee now, even if they offered it to me. There's no, no way I wouldn't even definitely go. Definitely not. Definitely not. But that's just, you know, it's a big scar, you know, on this guy's career. And, you know, that the social standing, social media mm-hmm. standing does mean a lot. So we'll you see what kind of patience. weight that carries. You have to have patience and you have to, you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful that I have been blessed with that. Where if I see something on Twitter, I can read the comments or like I did a couple of weeks ago. Someone made a really bold statement and I got in a conversation with her that lasted about 10 hours over Twitter, comment to comment, but it was amicable and we left as friends. We both left with a greater understanding of each one's position. Yeah. The caveat, you know, the caveat is, is that you are of a certain generation that learned to read more than 140 characters. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's the di- that's the difference, you right. know? So I think this new generation, they're not there, man. They're ticking, picking up these little snippets of stuff uh, because they don't have the time nor energy to, to research, to read. You know, they want that information given to them. And whatever's given, that's what they'll take. So that's, again, that's the scary part about, you know, uh, raising children at this time or even, you know, trying to get out there. There's a lot of... There's a lot of misinformation, disinformation, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, it goes so back yeah, to the church scary. shooting down here in Antioch, Nick, where you sent me the post on Instagram and said, hey, look at the third comment down. Yep. And the second, it took three comments. And then Jason, I know you remember this too. It took three comments for the N-word mm-hmm. to come out. And it discredited all the people that were railing against him in my mind. Like it was like, okay, uh, c- can we be normal? Can he have committed a crime and and see his day in court and go to jail? Are there other explanations at play? Did he have a psychotic break, which I've seen happen to a person? I believe, Nick, you have as well. And and it is night and day and it is terrifying. Um, But but an individual loses their right for those types of considerations because we want to to damn them right away and get our voice heard. And the worst thing about social media and the best thing about social media are the same. It's that it provides a platform for every idiot on the planet. <laughs> Just it's it's the yeah, greatest it's voice in their opinion, yeah. right? Yeah, it's the greatest thing and it's the worst thing. So so but this all kind of plays back with into privacy and 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 how we want 
our name to be thought of and said and respected. And some of us have privacy and, and a personal policy of privacy within our own marriages. Right? So some of us are open books. I know that. But it all starts when you're dating. And it can be really silly and uh, sort of out there. Like, for instance, when you're dating your spouse and she has on fake eyelashes or a really puffy bra (laughs) or she uh, does any of the uh, wears high heels to make herself look taller. Those are all little sort of fun, attractive white lies and things you're trying to keep from your partner. I think they even have like butt shapers now where you can put, put kind of put on a fake ass and then you put your jeans on and <laughs> it's a, it's kind of endless, but then there's more subtle things that, that you, you want to hold back during the dating process, but we bring some of that into our relationship as well. And I'm curious, Jason, from a dating standpoint, to when you got married, was there anything you held over from that process, uh, from those times? And what were some of the things funny or serious or however you want to take it that you kept from your spouse during the dating process? I don't think I kept anything, uh, that was, a. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, I don't pretend a lot as far as, as far as I know about, about who I am. Um, uh, intentionally but um y- y- you know you, you protect you protect some of the things uh, that they do carry over um you know uh, weaknesses in in character or uh, uh or you inflate part of yourself um with uh, with ego or, or whatnot that uh, that you have to try to keep up with and that that doesn't happen i i don't know i don't know necessarily if i if i had any of that um that i carried over because i don't <clears throat> i didn't tell any mm, i didn't really fib at all in the dating process um but you know i think maybe i i if i did something i omitted um i had i omitted things uh about who i was or who I wanted to be sort of lying but, by uh, omission. Yeah. But, but ironically I, I was, I was omitting those things from what I would allow myself to do anyway. What, what do you so, mean? Give us an example of that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it, it would, it, it could be fair to say, um, that, you know, I, I, I omitted my, my passion to, uh, for uh, for performance and art, to a degree, it was there. I'm really surprised it was, by that. It, yeah, it was stated, but it wasn't. Um, uh, it, it wasn't out front, like probably it should have been, because perhaps I didn't have anything to show for it. So I kept it. Uh, I kept it back as one of my goods. You know, you don't have anything to prove. I mean, you don't have anything to prove it, then you might say, well, I'll show that to her later. But then you kind of get caught in that circle where <clears throat> you're not showing, uh, even though you still believe it, then you're not showing it to yourself. And then that doesn't surface. And it's just kind of cyclical almost. So for uh, you, it was where, one of those things where you felt like if you didn't have something to show her, that was something that she could either play and listen to or watch on video. It wasn't worth bringing up. I always feel like that. Really? Wow. That's interesting. I can't prove it. I, I don't. I don't know how. <sighs> what the fuck am I doing talking about it? Now you had things written. Does she read any of that stuff? Um. No, but most of it was incomplete. Mm. I had things recorded, but mm, most of it was not. Uh, great. And it wasn't what I wanted. I felt it was incomplete too. Mm -hmm. So I'd sample it out. And if I didn't get the reaction that I thought I was going to get, that's probably on me, but you know, I pulled it back. (laughs) 
look, do we ever get the reaction we want? It's like, no. it's like, no, yeah. That that always that you're always set yourself up that way when your expectation is really high and then it doesn't doesn't meet that expectation. It's that's a tough one. So fast forward us into the marriage. How has keeping that back affected your relationship, if at all, or affected you? I think it's just uh, slightly kept me from being me. I, I, I think when you deny yourself. Um, part of your core, uh, it uh, it starts to bleed or seep mm-hmm. into the rest of you. Yeah. Until you find yourself not being you, kind of in general. Uh, and, and, and even if you're being you in in part, you've you've allowed um, you you've allowed part of your core to be compromised. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a thought right now, but there's a chance that allows every part of your personality to be compromised to something you're not naturally okay with. You know, I, I really, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm with you. I'm curious though. Were you, did you discover anything that maybe your, your wife kept from you? That, that sort of unfolded itself once you got married, uh, similar to, to you, where, where she held back a piece of her personality from you? I don't know if she held back any, you know, for like a piece of her personality. Um, maybe that uh, she was uh, kind of relating back to a recent episode, um, more extroverted than, uh, than she had let on. Uh, yeah. That, uh, you know, she was uh, more social and uh, being part of that, of, of of those people who are socially elevated by the rest right. of us as a, a, and, and the importance there. That, that was kind of uh, hidden, uh, not with ill intent, um, probably more for comfort uh, on my part uh, that... Uh, yeah, um, and, and to be fair, maybe not. Uh, I, I, you know, this is also what we do. You don't pay enough attention to yourself. Mm. I know that, that most of us that that seems to not be a problem, but it it, it is. Yeah, absolutely. You, you don't you don't pay attention to your true self. You pay attention to the, you know, the big shit that stands out, but not the little little parts that are you know, part of your core. So perhaps, uh, she wasn't necessarily hiding anything from me. She was just not paying attention to what was in her core that was important Mm. and, uh, to her. And, uh, you know, you find that out later. Is anything worth hiding? Is there something that's just something where you would say I hid that back, but I, I think it's worth continuing to keep back and you don't have to be specific necessarily, but is there a type of thing that you would say that doesn't help me at all? So why would I ever bring it up? Yeah. You know, I I'd probably say yes. I mean, those are the, <clears throat> I mean, some of them you could say like the little white lies that people tell, you know, those, that's why they call them white lies. They're, benign um and there's some things that might have even affected you or changed you in a certain way um made you the person you are now because i know that that's kind of you know one of one of brian's things you know it's like a lot of things that happened in the past you know you look at him like yeah maybe i could say i wish that change wish that was different but all that stuff made you you know so it's like it's not about focusing on those things even if it's like you know by omission so i don't need to tell you that that happened. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> you know, it made me who I am today. So focus on who I am now. You know, it's only I think it's only those things that, um, you know, might creep into your relationship, mm-hmm. um, you know, in a negative way, might might resurface somehow. Like those are the types of things like if it's going to come out, you know, in, in some way, shape or form, 
you know, it might be best to talk about them early, but that's hard, right? Because, you know, like we were saying, in the dating phase, you're wooing at that point, you know, and you never Woo-woo. really know. Yeah, right. You never really know what a game changer might be for the other person. You know, it could be minor. It could be major. You know, something that you think is insignificant could be really significant, you know, for them. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. So, yeah, I would say that, you know, yeah, there are some things that are worth, you know, keeping to yourself. But, you know, as Jason mentioned, it's not those things that, you know, make you who you are, right? As in who you are today, if you're, if you're suppressing something that is keeping you from being your true self or keeping you from doing the things you want to do. Yeah. That's, you know, holding that back. It's, it's never going to work out right. At some point it's going to blow up. Yeah. And, and I think one of those things for me sort of very, very early on, I think even while my son was still in the womb a little bit (laughs) was, was one of these things where me having a child or having a child on the way was certainly a need to know thing. Uh, you, uh, you did not get told that unless you need to, needed to know. And the thing is, is it's funny because you, I view that as sort of playing yourself, right? So I kind of played myself because should I've liked any of those people and then told them late, it could have ruined and wasted all my time. So it's better just to say that up front but then you kind of have to live with what could have been should have, would have, could have kind of deal. Yeah. Well, I'll jump on that one real quick and just say that I, I told my wife late. Yeah. You know, did, about, about my little that. one. And, um, you know, it was, a, it came, it's a huge shocker to her. And, you know, it's one of those that she tells the story today. She was like, yeah, he waited until I was in love with him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's a great strategy. Great you chess know? move. Exactly. I was like, well, it worked out, right? I mean, you know, we've been together now. We we're married. Um, but yeah, it was one of those where it was just like, oh, well, that wasn't relevant to the conversation. And, and kudos to women because women are great about saying on the very first minute of the first date, okay, I was married before. I have yep. two kids. That's right. Deal with it. Do you like me or not? Yep. And then guys are the exact opposite. We're you're you, right. <laughs> we want to hide that shit. Uh, Brian, you're you're more of an open book, I think, than the than the other three of us. Is, is that a has that been a good thing for you? Are there pros and cons to it? If so, what are they? Well, I, <clears throat> so I would say that uh, it's more of lessons that I've learned. Mm-hmm. You know, like over time and failed relationships, and and you know, and what I'm comfortable with because I can tell you, you know, there were, I, I wasn't with my first wife. I wasn't as uh, open of, of, of who I really am as a person, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I was kind of really trying to hold on for dear life and trying to keep things together. And so, you know, probably wasn't as, uh, as, uh, not necessarily forthcoming, but you know, like I found, I you know what I found. I found like, if you don't sell yourself as who you really are, like, then you, you'll never be happy. Mm -hmm. For example, big video game player. Yeah. Love playing them. Um, and, uh, you know, with the first wife, I was like, Oh yeah, I kind of like those. Yeah, sure. Nah, son, love playing that shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so then when it came here, so then when it came down the, down the path and I'm like sitting on the beach playing a, playing a PSP, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, this is what, how I like to unwind, you know, I'm like in paradise, playing what I want to play, mm-hmm. you know? And she's like, oh, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like she was like very put off by that. So it's like, I found that, you know, because I wasn't as uh, necessarily lying, but I just wasn't as, you know, this is a small example, but you know, I wasn't as forward with who I am and what I enjoy to do. And, and, you know, it, it causes conflict down the road. And then it's like this constant, uh, you can't do what you want to do. And now, uh, do I even want to be in this relationship? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, cause then it's, it's just, it just compounds with other things. And so now, you know, I would say that, um, you know, if my wife, I mean, she knows, you know, everything I do, you know, I don't, you know, she knows I play Dungeons and Dragons. She knows I like to play video games. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't hide those type of things from her. And, and, and from an emotional standpoint, she knows, uh, she, I would say she knows how I feel. Mm-hmm you know, on a daily basis. Cause I'll tell her if I don't like something, I tell her right there. Yeah. Um, if I don't like, you know, if I don't like the way she talked to me or, or something like that, I'll, I'll bring it up right then. 
you know, or, or if I don't like something, I just don't hold those things back because they just fester and they blow up over time. But I will say that, um, you know, it's funny cause you know, with my wife, very much an open book, right. Mm-hmm. But with my children, my children, now there are people that, you know, maybe I lied to a little bit more. Uh, give us an example. Right. Um, well, don't let them listen to this one, but you know, Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Easter Bunny. No, but you know, like, um, for example, um, what would be a good example of this? Uh, you know, I, I don't think I would, you know, I think I've talked to my wife about my kind of hoodlum ways of me growing up in high school. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, just doing really juvenile and, uh, you know, borderline illegal things mm-hmm. and, um, or actually, they're not legal. So illegal things. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but I wouldn't tell my, I wouldn't tell my kids that, you know what I mean? Like, uh-huh. like my past, like I'm proud of my past, uh, to kind of Nick alluded to, like I'm proud of it because of who it made me today. But what I want my children to see is who I am today. I don't want them to see who I was in the past. Cause I might not be, cause that's not who, that's not who I am anymore. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I don't know, it's kind of, a, oh, I, kind of a catch. I, I had a similar situation very recently. My father came in town, as you guys know, uh, for the last week. And um, he, he brought like a giant suitcase full of old stuff that he wanted me to keep. And so I have all these things. And one of the things was uh, an old chore contract that he made for me. And then and then another one of the things was one of my old report cards. And I did really poorly in high school. So when I say really poorly, I mean, like some of my six weeks grades were in the 30s. Okay, so it's fairly poor. Yeah. So I don't have that persona within my own family. So when my oldest daughter, who we spend so much time and energy and money and effort on making sure she has the best education possible, she could not get over it. She said, I I would have never guessed you would have a report card like this. And I really didn't know what to say to her because on one hand, I felt the embarrassment of that report card all over again. Uh, It was like, I've, I've left, I've left their artifacts of a, of a different version of me that have just come to light and I'm embarrassed by it. And I tried to pull out the lesson part of it in my mind, but it was hard because I realized how far off the mark I was then and how hypocritical I must seem to them today. And it's not that it was a secret. I've told them that I had a rough time in high school and that I had to overcome some things. But that's a very macro way to put it. So when she got to see the report card, see the teacher's comments about how disruptive I was in class or how absentee I was or uh, how tardy I was for on assignments and the actual grades, then it became so real. And it was weird. It really was. It was this weird thing. And so I'm I'm like that with my kids too, but I think I'm like that with my wife. I, I, I share a little bit about my past, but I, I don't ever go into the weeds because the weeds is where the shame is. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's funny about that, about going into the past. I think for me, I've been on somewhat of a journey of discovery. It's probably, I mean, probably forever, but you know, since I've been with my wife, and, you know, things have come out in conversation, you know, that about my past that make me realize more, you know, why I am who I am today. Like, she, and for her, it's, it's nice to hear because what I'm in the, the point that I'm trying to make is that I didn't even know these things were things, right? Like I didn't know that, that situation that happened when I was seven really impacted the way that I do this thing that I do now. Right. Right. But it's like having these conversations with my wife based off of maybe experiences that she's having or had with her family. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, but when we were kids, you know, like, for example, I think we might have talked about this before on on the podcast. But, you know, I don't remember having birthday parties 
you know, with mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. You know, that wasn't a thing. Like we just did it at the house and, you know, it was my immediate family. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But my wife was like, no, that's not how we did it. You know, like we had all our friends come over and there's a big cake and all this stuff. I'm like, no, we, we had a little cake, you know, got from the store down the street. You know, it's like, no, it wasn't a big thing. Mm-hmm. But as we have those types of discussions, things come out about my personality that are linked back to stuff that I didn't even think about. You know, again, it made me who I am today and I'm, I'm good with that. But at the same time, some of these discussions uh, let my wife better understand why I am the way that I am. So, yeah. yeah so even though, so it's not like it's, it's secrets, right? Cause they're not intentionally hidden, but there's mm-hmm. things that have been hidden from me <laughs> that I can't even explain, but as they come out, it's just like an aha moment, you know, for myself and my wife. And in some of those cases, I can look back and be like, oh, that's why this is the way I am, the way that I am in this case. Well, that's probably not a good thing. Right. And, and, <laughs> right. and my, my dad was an army brat and we went to 16 schools in 12 years. He couldn't keep any friends long term. So he didn't have those kind of birthday parties either. To cope with that, birthdays became not a big deal. And then as a child, birthdays then thus could not be a big deal for me. And so I didn't have those kind of parties either. It wasn't right. until, until I was older. Yeah, and, so it's either and, when you're older and, and that you affected me kids, too. Right, or you have a spouse who's really into par- into birthdays, you know, and the celebration, mm-hmm. like my wife is really into them. You know, so for her, it's kind of like looking at me like, why aren't you into this? You know, like, why is it hard <laughs> for you to actually like buy me a card? Like, that's the thing that she wants most really is just the mm-hmm. card. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like, Ugh. it's almost stupid, right? It's like, I don't want to buy this Hallmark Ugh. card. It's and, a waste of money. Yeah. And it's just, I don't want to do that. I don't see any value in it. But again, it's just different upbringings. And then I kind of, again, I look back and say, like, yeah, we didn't, we didn't get cards like that. Or my parents did give me a card. Like my, my wife, she gives me a card you know, she picked out the one that she wanted me to have. She wrote a note in it. She underlined specific words in the note for emphasis that, you know, just for me. <laughs> when I got cards, and my, and my parents still do it today. When I got cards as a kid, it was the card for, that they picked out. Love, mom and dad. Yep. Right? That's it. They, and there's not a lot of stuff. Now, later on, they started to write more poignant or personal things. Uh, but I remember that as a kid, just you get the card and it's a love mom and dad. We so, become our parents' kids. That's a, my dad writes long notes to me in my birthday cards. So I, in turn, write long notes in my birthday cards. Yeah. yeah so that's, that's learned from my dad. Yeah, but, yeah, but looking at, again, looking back at that, you know, now in the relationship, you know, yeah, some of those things, again, not secrets, but things that uh, were not brought forth they do start to come out, you know, whether good, bad or ugly, they, they do come out in some way. Uh, you know, fortunately, I think for me, most of those things have been good, but I want to piggyback off of what Jason said about having a passion for something and, and kind of withholding that a bit, mm-hmm. because in my situation, you know, you know me, Chris, you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm a creative guy, right? I like mm-hmm. doing creative things. You know, I'm imaginative, I'm innovative in some cases. I like to just do, right? Mm -hmm. But the issue was, is that I didn't really know specifically how and where and in what context to channel that creativity. Like there wasn't one specific thing. It wasn't like, I want to be an actor. You know, I want to be a singer. It wasn't Mm -hmm. one thing. It was just, I like being creative. So yeah, my wife knew that and she saw that I was doing different things and, you know, my creativity would show up in work or at home. But now, you know, I have a creative focus, maybe multiple. One of those being this podcast, which takes up several hours, you know, on Mm -hmm. more than one night of the week. That wasn't an expectation going into the relationship, right, that I would be devoting this type of time to my creative pursuits. Mm-hmm. And so the expectations so, have changed. Exactly. So those expectations kind of grown have totally in the changed. relationship. Right. So again, this is always who I was, but how it has manifested is different from the expectation. Like the expectation might have been, okay, you do all that creative stuff at work and you can do that creative stuff at home and maybe you do this creative stuff with the kids, but work is expected, you know, 
home and kids is expected, this extra time that I'm taking, maybe you time, yeah, isn't expected. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But that is, you're right. It's that you time. It's like right now, you know, I'm not playing soccer like I used to. That's killing me. That's burning me from the inside out, just like Jason was saying. Like, it's it's ripping parts of my heart out every day that I don't play. Um, but it's like those expectations about family and work and how, how your house and your relationship with your spouse, like, that's the major expectation. Everything else is kind of like, uh, I don't know. You should be spending all that time doing that other stuff. And I have to respect that. To some degree, right? Like that wasn't the expectation, but on the does other he, side, does he it, have to respect that, Jason? Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> he, knows <laughs> it. he knows I do. But yeah, you, but you, you it's do both have to sides. respect it. Um, I guess my my only question there is when you were talking about that, I thought you know because we the, all these extra things, right? Um, that's that's kind of what we're saying about everything that's on top of what you're already doing. So you kind of have to make time for that. Now, maybe if you're, except for spending extra time in hopes to actually do that something all the time, like maybe you shouldn't, I don't know, be allowed to do it. That sounds terrible, but like, cause I thought about soccer or really anything that you're like, this is really what I love to do. I should, I should have that me time and be allowed to do it. And I thought if I was talking to myself, not any of you guys or, or your spouse's response, but in a negative way that I talk to myself, uh, which I probably need to talk to somebody about a little further, but I would think motherfucker, if you're not doing that with your life, <laughs> don't try doing that with your wife. Like, I don't know, man. I, I think it's just, you know what I mean? Like I, I hear I, you, but it's like, I don't, I don't feel like that like at it, all. Like I know. for me with my wife, like she loves to dance, right? That's what she used to do. You know, so when she why was younger, she be in dancing. And that's my thing. Like, I am like, I'm it, the it, biggest one to encourage her to do that. Like get in it, make it happen because you know, your heart is there, you know, and that's, that's something that she needs to do. And at some point I think she'll end up doing it because my daughter will be in dance, right? Like that'll be her reason for getting back into it. But I know that it's a part of her that she misses, right? So I'm totally all about it. I'm encouraging, make that happen. On my end, it's just that's, you know, for me, it's a commitment that takes me away from my family, which is why I stopped playing, you know, which is why she asked me to stop playing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, right. But I'm saying if she committed to that and that took her 16 hours a week, maybe you wouldn't be so committed to encouraging her. And maybe not, you know, and but I, and one thing I would say that zero hours a week, because I know that's a part of her is not OK. Right. So that's no, no, the thing I, you have to be respectful of. It's like. You do. Yeah, you, you, you totally do. I just I just think about that with all our extracurricular curricular activities. Like if I continually rail about needing to do art or creative things um, <laughs> that take time away from spending time with my spouse or uh, well, let's say it's just my kids. Uh, let's let's forget the spouse thing for a minute. It's just just kids. You know, maybe the mistake there is back on me and that I don't deserve to spend that time because I should have crafted or I need to still find a way to craft my life to do that during the monotonous hours that, that, you know, I, I, I don't know. No, see, like, the, my thing is I want my, so the thing with soccer for me, I'll just put it on that one is that that's an experience that I want to share with my family, right? I don't need to do it by myself. Like they can come to the games, you know, I want them Now there's a period of time when I wouldn't have them out there when they were, you know, my son was a lot younger. They didn't want them out there get at the games or really early in the morning. It's cold, whatever. But that's an experience that I want to share with them. I want them to see me out there performing. I want them to see me out there just as happy and in my zone. Mm -hmm. So it isn't necessarily something that, you know, they don't get to experience as well. You know, so, you know, the, the podcast, maybe that's different. You know, because they don't get to experience that. So that is something that is totally my own. And therefore, it's kind of cut off from them. Uh, but some I would say that most of my other pursuits that I've had, they're all inclusive. Like everybody's in on it. We can make this a thing. 
Um, but it does in the growing now, the performance stages. Performance is inclusive, but the practice is not. Yeah, it, the growing stages, right? So the performance, the the development of the craft, the development of the artifact, whatever it is, yeah, it takes time. But anyway, I think that's the the change in expectation where it's not okay for me to just take the time and not be respectful of the time I'm taking away. Okay, so right? what there happens? What happens when? You need the expectation to change. I think that's uh, honestly for me. It's, it's always a conversation first about what the goal is. Like that's the thing that's worked. I think that's the hardest thing with. I think Jason was mentioning this earlier about like if you're not going to do that, like that's not what you're going to be going forward. Like everything else gets off the table and you're just that thing. Like soccer, that's a hard one. Like the goal is personal. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't plan to become a professional soccer player. Right. So playing, it's just the act. <laughs> right. There's no end goal. Like the podcast, I can state an end goal. You know what you and I are doing with Bonsai, that's I can state an end goal. Mm-hmm. Right. So the hours, the work, the effort, the time, it's all going to something that we, you know, uh, that'll have great value in the future. But yeah, the soccer thing has always been it's just a personal thing, right? I need to do that for me. Right. So that, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, um, I, I think that what happens is, cause I think that we're all saying a version of this, maybe outside of Brian is we want the you time to be the work. Now me playing basketball, you playing soccer, that might be even outside of that. Right. But the issue is, is, that stuff we call me time is been put in this box called Nick's or Chris's or Jason or Brian's hobbies, their likes, their dreams or whatever shitty box that sort of life throws those things in and, and, and the life you've set up and the expectation you've set up puts it in. But the reality is, is you really want to kind of unpack that box and make that thing you do that, that supports your kids and your wife. So you're not derelict of duty as a husband or as a provider. That's right. But that building part of it, that's the hard part, right? Because it you do because you didn't while doing all right. the other. But it's because of the to Jason's point earlier. It's because of that initial mistake of not coming into the relationship that way. Because we right. because and let's maybe call a spade a spade. We didn't think we could sell ourselves that way. <laughs> yeah. Right. So Jason talked about at the beginning. I undersold my art and my need to do it because I didn't have anything to prove that it would be viable. Right. The business plan wasn't crafted and he didn't have the angel funding behind it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, right. this is legit. But, it's going forward. But, right. but the reality <laughs> is, is 10 years prior to today, had he been doing that as his everyday day job, then it would already yeah. be uber successful. <laughs> that's right. And that's the expectation. <laughs> Right. That's, that's the trap. expectation that's the, going. That's in. the part that pisses you off when you start thinking about it. So what would you mm-hmm. So I've been thinking about that for like, if you were to give advice to someone, you know, not who's going to get married, but just, you know, a young person. And sometimes I think about that and say, yeah, if you're not either doing what it is you want to do uh, or on the path, right, working towards that thing, um, you should consider I'd say the the constraints that you put on yourself. Mm-hmm. And if you find along the way a partner who is working with you to get to those places, then that's a good partner to have on the long term. Mm-hmm. But if not, if that you know, if you're not finding a partner who is working with you to get there, then you might need to to wait a little bit and figure some other things out. Yeah, but yeah, that's the, the advice it, I always give Nick is find the thing you love to do most and protect it. Yeah. And it's hard when you don't know what that thing is. Right. Mm-hmm. That's, that the, that's the other that part of the really advice. Difficult. Yeah. That's the other part of the advice where that fails. It's kind of like if you're, you know, your younger days, you may still be figuring those things out. 
you may and, not and, have and you might think it's trivial on it yet. You might think yeah, it's yeah. trivial. Like Brian said, I didn't mention I love to play video games to my first wife because it seemed trivial. It seemed unimportant uh, to, to mention. And then he found out it's actually a conflict because he likes to wind down differently than her. And there was a different expectation there. I know that Sunday football was a battleground for me. Now, that's not anything that's going to make me any money, unlike Brian, who wins all his fantasy leagues. But, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but, but I, but I grew up watching football on Sunday. And that time you waste watching football can be weaponized against you when the other side of your relationship isn't satisfied. So you don't get to go to your wife and say, Oh my God, I'm so time poor right now. I need to do this. this is, well, why didn't you doing that shit while you're watching football all day? Yep. <laughs> And then you're like, yeah, uh, because I was watching football, football right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I actually yeah. um, had to step back and say, OK, football is only a certain time of the year. And ideally, I would like my wife to like football as much as I like it. I grew up ideally. playing it. That's what I, you know, I love watching it. I enjoy it. I enjoy the competition. I enjoy the strategy. Ideally, my wife would just sit down on the couch and watch it with me. We'd have lunch. We'd drink a beer together and we'd talk and make it family time and valuable. My wife will not do that. Uh, and so now, you know, 11 years into our marriage, uh, 15 years about into our relationship or 13 Maybe I was off there 13, 14 years. Anyway, I, it's not a slight on her. Like she, that's not who she is. And she's, so she's not going, she, the bending of her personality has happened to its extent at this point. So that I could watch a football game, maybe even invite Brian up and we can watch it together. And it's great. But she, but to ask her to come in on a regular Sunday and watch it or to not be a busybody, which is what she is. She likes to get things done and run around and she doesn't enjoy it. That's not fair to her. Yeah, I've been trying to get my wife to watch soccer ever since we've been together. It's, it's not going to happen. happen. It's not going to happen. Yes, it's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's not. Now, Brian has a situation where his wife will sit down and play video games with him. But but Brian, I, I do think that. But she won't watch this. Football. Right. I, I was going to say, I do think a part of it, though, too, for you is you're an open book and you have um, your me time. But is there a price to pay on the wife time? Well, yeah, there is. But, you know, when I say it's my me time, I mean, yeah, I watched um, I watched the Titans play this uh, this this Sunday. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same time, I did like all the laundry. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'll overcompensate the things I know she hates. Uh, and I usually will do it during the same time. You know, now I'm not going to do that every Sunday. But, you know, I mean, if he's like, oh, he's watching, he's watching football. No, I ain't doing that shit it? every Sunday now. <laughs> no, no, but like, you know, oh, oh, he did all the laundry. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you have to give back. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> you got to pay, pay it for it. Check it. Check it you got to pay it for I it. I always do the laundry while I'm watching soccer. It's, I do it every yeah. time. Yeah. And, and for me, what I do is I say, go wherever you want to go. Schedule work appointments. I'll watch the kids. So that's what I do. I'll watch all the kids while the football game's on so that she well, might run about the country way. for free. Yeah, or, or, it, or I think free it works with Sal that way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's good. But but what if the goal, and this is where it gets in, like it's not. Because uh, you have I, the opposite situation, right, Jay? Like your wife loves football yeah. and you don't. She loves football mm -hmm. and, I, and I like it. Gotcha. Uh, but. Uh, you poor soul. But I, I Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's so here's the, like oh well I did this while I watch or I did this like what if it's simply I want to you know especially with, with our fucking lives that we lead now you know Monday through Friday tend to be fucked um, even a lot of times on Saturday you know between doing 
you know, doing, taking care of stuff around the house and with the kids, like what if that time is, it's unimportant. I don't care what you achieved. I just wanted to spend it with you. And I didn't want to not enjoy it while I was doing that. Right. Like I have share, this I have amount a of time. experience. Right. Like I have so many days sadly and and you know maybe i need to do something better with my monday through friday that i don't feel like this but i have so many days um the only so many days that i i actually get my free time to enjoy and i've chosen to enjoy them with you that i don't want to hear about your fucking me time Mm. And I don't give a shit whether you fold the laundry. And I'm not taking a piss on you guys for doing that. But like, I feel a little bit like, you know, like I can associate with that sentiment. Like, I don't care. Like, I, I do my best to get along with it. But it's not something that we can finally, you know, that we can come to agree on. And we don't have any other time. Like, it's, it's you know, if you spend four hours of your, of the day in the, in the meat of the day, um, with something that the other person can't enjoy, it's fine. Just recognize it doesn't matter what you do during that time. Like whether it's football watching or you go play golf, like it leaves the other person to go, Oh, well, I guess, I guess this time, this very limited time that I want to spend with my spouse, I'm not going to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a discussion I've had with my wife. I mean, I think, you know, again, she knows me really well, but it's like, that time that she and I spend together uh, is as important as the time that I spend doing the things that I want to by myself. Like that's, that's the way it is. There's no, mine isn't greater and the hour isn't greater, right? It's, it is as important. Yeah. So I make well, sure it's 90 minutes, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah, but that's what I mean. That, that time is, uh, is as important. So, you know, if I need to spend some time watching soccer, going outside, just being outside, whatever it is, it's, it's that important to me. So, you know, I, cause one of the things that I've, I've learned over time is that yeah, I can't always be for someone else. Mm-hmm. I die that way. Like this, I'm not enough for me. If I'm not enough for me, I cannot be all for someone else. Cause I'm never 100% there or I'm not a hundred percent of who I am or want to be. So I can't deny myself of that, yeah. but it's a delicate dance. It's a delicate, I can't, you know, I can't even really call it a balance, but yeah, you, I'm, I'm with you, dude. You know, those few hours that you have, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's a, yeah, fair, it's count, a, it's a fair counter argument and to, to what Jason's time saying. Hours, though, it's hard. Yeah. I, I think Jason, my counter to that is, and it's a rule that I actually had forgotten about a little bit. The reason I didn't, for example, marry my son's mother Is because I knew that she was the type of person that would require at the time that would require me to create a life for her. And in my current wife, I thought I had someone who was so busy and so into her own life and career that I would be left alone (laughs) by just the nature of her interests so that I because I knew that the things that I love to do and the things I'm good at require solitude and long stretches of solitude and thinking and pondering uninterrupted. I it's muddled. I, but, but, I, I, but, I understand. But in, understand but, but in, the, in the action, that it changes. doesn't really work, does it? Yeah. I mean, but I understand what you're saying, but like, what, like you're able to do some of those things. Um, you're willing to take, you're willing to, take away from yourself to add to yourself. So when you're able to do that, when, when the activity gives you that ability, then it's a little more understandable. Like maybe this, Mm -hmm. what we're doing right now, you know, you're not necessarily taking away the precious time she has to do it, Mm -hmm. but that's where, that's where, and and that's, I know it's That's, that's right. doesn't seem fair for most guys, but when it comes to sports, whether it's playing or watching, it takes time away from everyone because they tend to happen during prime time hours. And I'm not talking about on your network. I'm just saying during life hours, that's when they happen where everybody has a moment to enjoy each other. 
except it's relegated for one person to sports. Mm-hmm. I see what you did there with relegated as well. And, <laughs> and, uh, so, and well, you know, nice little soccer term. And, and it's funny because it's so true. The vision I had of football on Sundays is not the case at all. When I grew up, I watched football with my dad side by side. It was family time. And I thought that my son. What was your mom doing? Going to church. She took the girls to church and dad and I got to stay home with dad and watch football uh, because my dad was religious. and My mom was uh, at the time. And so it worked out nicely. I guess my wife needs to be, stop being religious right. um, and I'll have to pick it up. Right. And, and that's kind of that's that's kind of how it worked out. But in my household, no one watches it with me. My daughter, my oldest daughter's not into football, uh, at least watching it on TV. She likes to go to the high school games. My son likes to go to the high school games. Well, that's not about and football. Does, right. No, it's not. And, and doesn't watch it on TV with me. I don't think my son has ever watched a football game with me. Um, in 15 years, he might've watched the Super Bowl with me. Uh, but, but we'll watch a basketball game together. Uh, he likes that. Um, my wife doesn't really watch him with me unless it's a special game or we actually went to the stadium. And the closest I've gotten lately is my youngest daughter will come in and she'll sit beside me for five minutes and say, who's that team? Who's that team? Okay. They're winning. Who's closest to our city? That team. Okay. That's who we're rooting for. (laughs) <laughs> that's what, what color are we right, exactly. there you go. and 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 she's kind of the most interested in me in general and so and that's typically who i need to watch so that my wife can be free because uh, other two kids are like a miniature adults walking around they don't need watched to be watched right they watch themselves so really it's about watching the littlest child so she can go shopping or do the things she wants to do on sunday and that's how we've worked out that compromise. But it's not even, my point is, is it's not even as emotionally glamorous as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be father and son watching football, passing on the tradition. And life throws you those curveballs. My kid likes basketball and skateboarding. My kid likes band. They, right. Like he, he doesn't watch any of them with me. Like none of my kids watch them with me. Um, and I've made, I've tried to make it like this big spectacle, you know, like, <laughs> Hey, I'm going to grill out. Hey, I'm going to, you know, let me cook something special. Let me bake something. Let's make pizzas. The hard sell. And still nobody. Yeah. yeah. And nobody, uh, still nobody, you know, and that's you ironic because you don't like college football and college football is the last football that involves a band. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> the Washington Redskins have a band. Man, you can't even bring stuff up around yeah. Brian, dude. Do they, start, do they start doing some Indian chant where they disgrace a whole race yeah, or something? You know, I, I would know. say the highlight. No, I hey, say yeah, the hey, highlight yeah. of the Titans no, is when the TSU plays at halftime. So, yep. for some seasons, at least some seasons, it was the best thing yeah. all year watching the, the TSU band. Is no TSU. joke, man. The TSU band is no joke. That's uh, the aristocrats. Yeah, they're, they're they're kind of the bomb. Uh, they are. Yeah, that's a, that's a good band to play for, by the way. So, no, but I know what you mean. It, not but a good football uh, team to play for, but the band's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like mm. <laughs> that's how you sell. That's how you sell your son, Brian, and watch these games. <laughs> Tell him the band. band's playing at halftime. <laughs> yeah, and it's going to be a great. Band. Now, why are these? Yeah, but uh, but no, I know what you mean. But like to me, um, I don't know, man. I'm I'm going to selfishly take my time. Now, at the same time, uh, if there's something special that's going on on a Sunday, I've got DVR, I'll record it. I don't watch every game live. You know, usually, um, you know, typical Sunday for me, um, I set my lineups um, <laughs> and at noon, yeah, and at noon, I make sure everybody's starting, you know, nobody's sitting at the last second. And uh, at noon, I've got the game recording, usually got it on pause in the office and uh, I'll go and fix the kids lunch. You know, make sure everybody's good. About 12.30, 12.45, then I start watching the game. And then I fast forward the commercials on the meantime. But you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't like, uh, yeah, it stopped being appointment television for me. I think all um, all TV has pretty much uh, become non-appointment television with me. You know, all of them are kind of uh, with the beauty and the technology of DVR. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, 
I've kind of been able to manipulate time, if you will, uh, almost a time lord. Um, <laughs> time lord. The doc- <laughs> the doctor Who. Doctor a little Who. Doctor Who for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The time um, but, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I get what you're saying. Um, Do you remember I took you but, to you breakfast, know, Brian, a couple of years ago? Out at, that glorious yeah, at Farmhouse. See, I at the morning I, after. I yeah, the morning after I, I satisfied you. Uh, that was gross. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Yeah, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> gotta pause. <laughs> No, no, you don't even put fucking seals yeah. there because the, the morning, like, the morning after it's true. even that's worse true. than what it's the morning after. I made your yeah. boxers wet. Right. Uh, <laughs> oh, so, man, so bad. No, but I, I learned my lesson. Like you were so fucking stressed out. It was supposed to only be between me and Jerry's <laughs> desk. <laughs> oh no! Oh, that's fucked up. That's, that's, a, that's an edit. Those are parking hey, seals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this thing is going off the rails. Me, you, and and uh, and Sharon. Sharon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you were so stressed out that morning about getting your lineup set and I was like I'm never taking this dude to breakfast again like I'm, I'm, I'm stressing this fucking guy out man like he is so stressed out like he can't be here because he's got to get his starting lineup right and I don't know what was happening but you were stressed out about somebody starting and I was like oh it was a, it was a championship it wasn't it um, it was I want to say it was late in the season and um that was uh, Marshawn Lynch yeah, I think was, it was maybe yeah, going to start. Maybe not going to start. I think it was beast mode. And I'm sitting yeah, here like, man, yeah, if you don't eat shit. your twenty two dollar breakfast, I'm gonna get heated. <laughs> 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 but you, but you couldn't. You were stressed out. You were like, you, you. I was like, take Brian to dinner. Right. Noted. Take him. Yeah. <laughs> take him for wings and a beer at lunch. Do not take this dude to breakfast on a Sunday. <laughs> you know what though you know i mean like and, and let's you know to to get let me let me explain to you my my mentality at the time and now it's not that like okay. that right but um I, there's a there is a christmas ornament on my tree and it represents that season mm. of fantasy because i went something like in all my leagues i went like something like 30 something and two wow like I, or I, it was like, and it was 40, it was like 40 something and two. Like I won every single league that year and, and, uh, cashed out in all mm-hmm. leagues. Okay. I lost two games the whole season. There's a Christmas ornament on the tree because, because we had no money that year. And the only reason we had Christmas was because I cashed out in all my leagues that year. Ah, that's so, awesome. And so that's awesome. That is why, that is why I was so stressed out that day. Wow. Yeah, because let, it was let, let the twenty-two dollar breakfast get cold. It's all good. You're right. <laughs> yeah, but that's what that was about. To be honest, I mean, to be straight up honest, I mean, I'll show you that there's a there's a. My wife actually put a Christmas, uh, you know, a little uh, ornament like a, a fantasy football ornament in my stocking that year because because if I wasn't so obsessed and and had, and uh, had won, like you know, the things would had to start going back. Send us a picture of that ornament. I'm, I might make I it this episode's image. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. But that that's what that's about, you know, and, and, you know, I don't know. And now, you know, it's not so dire, right. of course, but at that time, dude, it was dire. Like, you know, <laughs> them, them, them $22 eggs, I, I couldn't afford them. <laughs> we we got to get beast mode yeah, we going. Gotta, we, these fantasy leagues got to pay off. You, you're like a, <laughs> like a gambler in Vegas, man. This is intense. There's a time. All yeah. right, so, so I'll wrap us up on this question for Jason. If should you hide shame from your spouse throughout your marriage? Shame. Uh-huh. Ding ding. I don't. I don't know. You're gonna have to be more specific. You mean like personal shame? Shame of personal shame. Of, of shame of of who we were, who what we did. Anything like that? Yeah, any type of shame you're facing? I don't know. I don't know. I I don't mean to adjust the question, but I've been thinking a lot about what Brian was saying uh, about uh, well, what Brian was saying about kids, and uh, I've thought a lot about. Uh, it's, you know, I, I've had some. Um, my my father, he's uh, seventy seven this year, and we've been having kind of those uh those conversations that are great but they scare you a little bit you know what i mean because yeah. they feel like the ones that you have as it's closing mm-hmm. 
uh, but I think I thought to myself, uh, how many things, and this is not, I don't think my father's ever going to hear this, but, <laughs> but in case he does, like, it, it's not a slight at him. It, it's not a, you did something wrong, but I, I don't know. I think about how many things that I could have, I could have benefited from had I not had the, I'm showing my son who I want him to be. Mm -hmm. Instead of having, I'm showing my son what a man goes through. Mm -hmm. And I think about that with, with, with my kids, you know, whether it's my son or my daughter, like, I don't know if that's valuable. I don't know if it's, I don't know if hiding our shame and our, you know, the things that we're ashamed of or, or not proud of, uh, were really good. And I, and I say this as a, as a, as a previous suicidal teenager, mm -hmm. literally. That, I mean, might, might it have been good to, for one of my parents, whether it's my father or my mother, to, to tell me their shame, to say, let me, let me tell you what it was like for me. Let me tell you how fucked up life is for me. Or, you know, even as I aged, <laughs> let me tell you how fucked up it's going to get. And how heartbreak and uh, being disenchanted from the person that you want to be as to who the world sees you can can leave you uh, in the lurch of loneliness. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I I like I understand w w when you said that, Brian. I understand. I understand what you said. What you meant and your intent. But I, I don't. I'm not questioning that. I, I just know for my, myself, I don't know if that's helpful. It seems helpful. And that's kind of how we've always approached it. And I don't think that's good. So I don't, I don't know about the spouse. And right now I don't give a shit. But like I think about that with my kids. Like, do I tell my kids about the drugs? Do I tell them about jail? Do I tell them... <laughs> about the women, whether the bad stuff, you know, my embarrassment in lack of dealing with them or with my daughter. And I say, Hey, you know what? This is when your old man went too far. This is when I did something inappropriate. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I think you do. Yeah. I think you do when the time's right. You know, uh, a, a good example is my daughter is asking about getting your ears pierced and, you know, my wife's telling her, oh, you know, you'll have to, you know, wait or something. And, and you know, she knew what was about to come out of my mouth was, you know, I have my ears pierced because both of my ears are mm -hmm. pierced, but I never wear earrings mm -hmm. anymore. And, and she was like, no, no, no. She like hushed me and don't tell him that, you know? And I was like, well, I'm not going to tell her now. But it's not like I wouldn't tell her later, you know, I, I'm not going to tell her now because she's, you know, she's four. Right. And, you know, the, you know, she's just not really going to understand. Um, but at the same time, you, you know, I mean, it's a regret. I mean, I, I mean, I had them done. I mean, I don't I don't necessarily regret it, but it's like, you know, I had them done, whatever. But like, yeah, I mean, there's you're right. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you're not proud of. Right. Um, but I can tell you as once you have a teenager those things you're not proud of, they're going to start coming out in lessons that you try to teach your teenager because they are for me. I, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. Like the report card thing, which is like the most innocuous thing about my teenage life that could ever come out. And, and uh, there's a lot more to tell. And my son, uh, like a typical teenager, is going through his little teenage funk right now where he's a little bit down and has lost a girlfriend potentially and, you're trying to explain to them without sounding like a sleaze bag, there will be more women. Right. And uh, yeah. that, that, that tomorrow is a new day and life is long. 
in its shortness, if you will. Like, you know, it's like you're at the moment you're sitting in, it feels really short. But think about how long it took you to get here and all the opportunity and days and blessings you had up to that point. Um, so, yeah, I think there to your point, Jason, that's true. I think there is a difference between your kids and your wife, because when you tell the things you're ashamed about to your wife, all they can do is hold it. They are try to sink it down in some place inside themselves and, and try to not remember it when they think of you. Whereas your kids can be taught a lesson by it and you become more human to them. So the reason I asked specifically about the spouse is, is because I think it's a burden. I think about all the times that I've had even girlfriends tell me details about their other relationships and the fact that I have to hold it. I have to hold that stuff and how it made me feel. And uh, times I've done that to, to people I love where I've said something about someone else and without thinking, oh, man, that probably made them feel very small because I was complimentary to someone else. Right. And that's tough. And it's better that you just to me, it's better that you don't say it. But we, we will expound more on this because uh, our new topic series is uh, priorities and expectations and what happens when we change in a relationship or when the expectations change in a relationship. So we're going to be talking about this at least for the next couple of episodes and perhaps for uh, the month of December. Of course, we're going to have a wonderful Christmas episode. So stay tuned. This conversation will continue next week. Um, but again, gentlemen, thank you for this uh, great conversation. Good stuff. Yeah, good chat, fellas, for real. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Uh, everyone out there, you have been listening to the Married Not Dead podcast. To find show notes, read excellent blog posts, find links to all of the products or services suggested during the show, please visit our blog at MarriedNotDead.org. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast listenership on the Apple Podcast app, YouTube, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or any podcast app of your choice. After you subscribe, Please don't forget to rate and review. Uh, rate us five stars. And if you don't think that we deserve five stars, let us know uh, by going out to the Internet. Tell us why we want to hear why we don't. Uh, you can do that on Twitter at underscore married, not dead. You can also do it at Instagram with the same uh, handle. You can search us on Facebook at Married Not Dead. So you'll find our podcast page there. Drop us a line. Let us know what you think. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. So until next time, on behalf of Nicholas Bucks, Brian Comer, and Jason McConnell, I'm Chris Barkley. We'll see you all next week. All right, gents. Good night, boys. I say good day, fellas. I say good day. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash MND podcast. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from, including one of my personal favorites, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia by Mohsen Hamid. Do not judge this book by its title. The ending had me crying in the middle of a four hour flight to Los Angeles. It's made even better by Moshe's narration, and you can download How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia or any other audiobook of your choice today. Again, for listeners of the Mary Not Dead podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. So, to download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com forward slash MND podcast. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash MND podcast to get your free audiobook today. You will not regret it. <laughs>